Ralph McQuarrie is my favorite artist of all time. And my dad has been obsessed with eBay, eBaying things and going to garage sales and stuff and estate sales. And he happened to stumble across the holy grails to any Ralph McQuarrie collector's collection. So I'm, I'm so excited today. So he came across the Star Wars portfolio by Ralph McQuarrie and the Return of the Jedi Ralph McQuarrie portfolio. He also got the Empire Strikes Back one. It's like the longer uh, landscape version of these paintings and it's coming in the mail. So I couldn't fit it on my carry-on luggage. These could fit on my carry-on luggage on my way back from Florida. That will be coming in the future, but for now we're only going to do Star Wars and the Return of the Jedi portfolio. I'm sorry, I probably ruined your day because, because Empire Strikes Back is my favorite too, but for now we have these. So. I thought we'd start with the Star Wars portfolio by Ralph McQuarrie. This is a collection of superb production paintings from the greatest space fantasy film ever made. Exclamation point. I agree. Copyright 1977. The edges, obviously it's not in pristine condition. I would honestly describe it as loved condition. Things are not used anymore whenever it comes to Star Wars. These are in loved condition <laughs> and I prefer it that way. These are the astonishing paintings that helped bring Star Wars to the movie screen. The mind-boggling imagination and graphic brilliance of artist Ralph McQuarrie captures all the excitement, energy, and power of the film that has already thrilled millions, and is destined to be the movie phenomenon of all time. Destined to be the movie phenomenon of all time. <laughs> all right. Wow. Wow, yeah, so I don't know if these are in order. I don't believe they are, judging by where each scene is taking place. But okay, so first we have um, a hanger in the Death Star. This thing is insane. So Ralph McQuarrie explains this painting as a necessary compilation of elements, the ships and the big hanger in the Death Star. Casual figures are present merely to establish scale. McQuarrie notes that this painting elaborates on a design, which is basically John Barry's. Barry made additional changes before the set took on its final form. These almost look like Death Star droids. Are they? Do you guys see that? They're stormtroopers, but... That's very odd, very odd. Wow, this is beautiful though. If I could live in a house, it would look like this. It would look like that. Next, rebel troops ready themselves for battle. Macquarie felt this Aztec-like ruin might be made of large, unthinkably dense stones with the property of minimizing gravity. The lights of a small of small fighter spacecraft are visible deep within the structure. Oh, I see that right here. This thing is insane. That almost looks like a shore trooper. <laughs> Wait. This is... Beautiful. Wow. It's so interesting to see the early designs for Star Wars. Like these came before, well before the movie. Macquarie is one of the original concept artists for Star Wars. And um, a lot of what he's actually made um, has not only been translated to film in a sense that it's changed drastically, like say his designs for Stormtroopers looks different, um, than what was put onto the screen, but in like Bad Batch and in Andor, like there are a lot of his designs that have come directly from his paintings. I think one of them was a trooper um, in Ralph McQuarrie Trooper Bad Batch. Yeah, it was in Bad Batch uh, season one, episode 14. They literally canonized his stormtrooper design. See? So cool. Uh, so here you could see the stormtroopers, obviously, and it's near the elevators on the Death Star. Uh, Lucas wanted a row of elevators in the Death Star and Macquarie made them individual tubes along one of the walls in the many deep canyons in the Death Star. There are a variety of robots, mutations, and oddball characters here, as throughout the film, filling out the concept that the nature of a galactic civilization was that they adapted in a variety of modes to the various environments. The large spaces may have helped air circulation, but Macquarie also speculates on the need for psychological space on such a space station. Interesting. We got a Death Star droid right there. And a Wookiee. 
being imprisoned. Poor Chewbacca. Poor Chewie. Wow. This is an action atmosphere, quote unquote, sketch of the hail of laser fire. Wow. This is very cool. I love the muted tones, but then the orange of the lasers just makes it pop. Very cool. This painting is another view of the Death Star hangar. The Empire brought in strange ships like Han Solo's and did readouts on them. The lights and windows in the back are part of the research and repair area. Very cool. I think one of Ralph McQuarrie's major things was scale. So in a lot of his paintings, what I love about them is that they're just big. They look large. Like they, they encapsulate such huge spaces in one beautiful painting. Wow, okay, here we have a sand crawler. And as I said about scale, wow. Um, you can see C-3PO and R2-D2, the early designs of C-3PO and R2-D2. And then you can see some Jawas underneath the sand crawler repairing things, probably. The sand crawler, a junk collecting operation, is a very large and rusty old vehicle containing many storage rooms. Macquarie envisioned a toothy front with a scoop that moved up and down like a present day garbage truck. Lucas later came up with the magnet arrangement by which R2-D2 is taken into the behemoth vehicle. Macquarie depicted the sand crawler against cliffs because the story, at this stage of its development, called for it to be hit by falling rocks which knock it off track during its commission, the two robots were to have escaped. The control devices which, in the film, restrained the robots had not been yet conceived. Beautiful painting. Okay. Princess Leia was blonde. Look at that. Princess Leia was blonde. Princess Leia honors those who saved the Rebel Alliance with an impressive ceremony at the Masasi Stronghold. Ben Kenobi, who was originally still to be alive at the end of Star Wars, can be discerned in the small group walking down the center aisle. Wow. Macquarie felt the banners would be indicative of a royal atmosphere. That's unbelievable. Obi-Wan Kenobi was originally supposed to survive. Ben Kenobi, sorry, Ben Kenobi. I love this painting. I love this painting. Here, Macquarie developed what was known as the Lash La Rue, Lash La Rue scene in the depths of the Death Star, the retractable bridge and chasm over which Luke and the princess were to swing on a thin cord were thought to be somewhere close to the center of the battle station. All structures were to radiate from a central core in ever widening circles. Dude, again with blonde Princess Leia. Y-wing fighters are being unplugged from their ground system in the rebel hangar at Masasi. For the figure at the left, Macquarie used a World War II photograph of a Navy pilot running across the flight deck with a clipboard in hand, changing the uniform, but capturing the gesture. The pilots have helmets which are capable of life support, working automatically whenever a malfunction in their aircraft occurs. The fighters are designed by Colin Cantwell, revised by Joe Johnston. We know those names. Cantwell class. <laughs> this is awesome. The open core apparent in the Death Star structure represented Macquarie's concept of a laser cannon. A large power source, accelerators, and condensers would all collect around the core, focus their terrific energy, and fire out through the bottom. At other times, spacecraft would come in and go through the top. In the film, however, the planet-destroying laser beam was focused through a dish-shaped structure on the Death Star's surface. Wow. Yavin. The beautiful, eerie red planet Yavin is seen from its fourth moon, the stronghold of the Rebel Alliance. Another moon is seen in the distance, right here. The bright emissions of distant spacecraft glitter through the fog which surrounds the heavily jungled moon. The lone figure situated high above the ground in this serene environment is a Rebel lookout. Imagine having the job of the guy that's just like, No, thank you. Oops, well, this was in the, this was in the middle. Whoopsies. Carol Wakarska wrote this. We'll read it at the end. We'll read it at the end. We'll save it for the end. If at this time you are still not subscribed, please subscribe by hitting the button below that says 
subscribe. And also, since you're down there, give the video a like if you're liking it. And comment down below which painting you like so far. I really like this one. This painting establishes the massive proportions of the Death Star in relation to Han Solo's Karelian pirate ship. It is here being seen pulled into the Death Star hangar by a powerful magnetic tractor beam. I find it really funny that they still haven't called it the Millennium Falcon. Han Solo's Karelian pirate ship. Han Solo's Karelian pirate ship. That's hilarious. I'm gonna call it that from now on. Millennium Falcon. Han Solo's Karelian pirate ship. The main characters are assembled here just prior to liftoff at Moss Eisley. They are in costumes like those in the film. The Moss Eisley pit, which houses Han Solo's Millennium Falcon, Karelian pirate ship, is quite a bit more sophisticated here, with huge mechanical lifts on tracks than it is in the film. Yes, this is more this is more accurate than this is more accurate to what the film looks like, but this is cool. And then you can see them all in their little in their costumes. So cute. Oh, here we go. This is my dream role. This is my dream role. I would, dude, I would, honestly, I'm serious, I would do anything to be like a TIE fighter pilot. Do I have it with me? Hold on. This is Gold Leader standing by. Escort into attack position. I would do anything to be a pilot. Dude, I would do anything to be a pilot in a show. I would do anything. This is Red Leader standing by. Oh my god. That's all, that's all. But honestly, I'd wanna be a TIE fighter pilot. How sick would that be? This painting provides the feeling of the battle above the Death Star from an enemy pilot's point of view. The targeting device in the cockpit was originally conceived by Macquarie as being a radar location indicator, registering what was behind and around the pilot out of sight. The pilot would rely on eye contact up front. In the film, however, the device registered the target in front and did not show what was behind the pilot. Very interesting, as you can see here. So cool. Okay, this is sick. We get to see a lot of creatures in this painting. This is awesome, wow. Macquarie envisioned the cantina as a primitive place framed by irregular archways and decorated with torn banners. It had a central gallery and a skylight over the bar. There wasn't much in it that would indicate that this was part of a society that had a lot of technical expertise. Lucas liked the feeling of it, but wanted occasional hints of mechanisms and technical sophistication, and Macquarie added these effects to the painting. The small balls which appear to be floating in the painting are called seekers, which are these. The seeker eventually became the device for training Luke to use the lightsaber. That's awesome. But in this painting, it was kind of an automatic police force programmed to dispense in its cold fashion the death sentence. It would float around until it found a person condemned by the Empire to die, then execute them? Luke, in a bit of trouble with an unhappy alien, wears a costume much like the one Han Solo wears in the film. That is definitely true. I can see it. I can see it. Wow. That was it. That was it. But like I, like I promised, we would read this. Here's a little insight to Ralph McQuarrie if you guys don't know who he is. Ralph McQuarrie would never have guessed he would one day be doing space fantasy artwork. Nonetheless, it was in his blood at a very early age. It was part of my life ever since I was a little kid, he remarks. I can remember drawings I did then of logging trucks with extra wheels and greater proportions and fantastic versions of scientific equipment. So when George, Lucas, asked me to do these things, I felt it was what I was meant to do all along. It is the most fun and comes easy to me. Wow. Macquarie, born June 13th, 1929. I think we're both Geminis. In Gary, Indiana, was influenced by his grandfather, who did watercolors, and his mother, who drew and painted. It wasn't long before he settled on a career in art. He took an art major in high school, studied technical illustration, and then went to work for the Boeing Company. There he met people who had studied at and recommended the Art Center School in Los Angeles. 
After two years in Korea, he enrolled at Art Center as an illustration student. The ease with which McQuarrie understood the highly technical visuals required for Star Wars is partially explained by his earlier work for CBS News Apollo coverage, as well as for Boeing, Litton Industries, and Kaiser Graphics. His work for CBS, doing artist renderings of the capsule's travel through space, making visible what could not otherwise be seen, generated quite an interest in McQuarrie's work. He was soon approached about doing animation, background paintings, and movie poster art. Some production paintings McQuarrie had done for Hal Barwood and Matthew Robbins brought him to the attention of director George Lucas. Imagine being bought to the attention of director George Lucas. Don't even. Director George Lucas in late 1975. Very soon after, they began discussing production paintings for Star Wars. Lucas suggested that McQuarrie approach the work from the point of view of ideal portrayals rather than feel restricted by what could actually be achieved in filming the situations represented in the art. So basically, do whatever you want to do. Don't worry about the parameters of a set. The first four or five paintings had been done when Star Wars was still in the development stage through 20th Century Fox. George Lucas felt that McQuarrie's paintings would not only be of interest to 20th, but by helping them to visualize his ideas would also dissolve any hesitation on their part to go ahead with making the film. Wow. So McQuarrie, thank McQuarrie for convincing 20th Century Fox to greenlight Star Wars. Thank you, 20th. Thank you, Ralph McQuarrie. The production paintings were of incalculable value when it came to discussing Star Wars' production design and costuming. They reflect various changes in visual concepts as well as the evolving storyline. The ideas of not only George Lucas and Ralph McQuarrie were concretized here, but also those of production designer John Barry and model designers Joe Johnston and Colin Cantwell. Two incredible people. McQuarrie's paintings were done in a combination of opaque gouache and acrylic on illustration board mounted on hardboard. Written by Carol Wakarska, director of publications, Star Wars. Wow. I wonder where those four, first five paintings are right now. Like, were they kept? I want to see the original, real paintings. I never saw them at Skywalker Ranch, unless they were in the main building, which I did not go into. Maybe they're in the archives? I hope they're gonna be at the Lucas Museum. I want to see them in person so bad. But yeah, made in 1977. Wow. I need to think of which my favorite, which one is my favorite from this. I think, honestly, it's probably, I would say it's this one. I would say it's this one. I just love, I guess not really the simplicity, but the atmosphere. It's very, like what I love about sci-fi. Just weird and eerie and LED and robots. Anyways, let me know which painting you guys liked the most from this set. In the next video, I'll be opening Return of the Jedi, so check that video out when it comes out. There will be a lot to see in that one. Anyways, I hope you guys have a wonderful rest of your day, night, wherever you are, and may the Force be with you, always.